Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Michelle Alexander, Deputy Executive Director for Development and Global Initiatives for Human Rights Watch. Human Rights Watch is an independent international organization that works to uphold human dignity and advance the cause of human rights for all. Michelle has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Michelle, for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it, Mark. So human rights, let's start with the fundamentals. Right. What is a human right? Well, human rights was, it has a long history, but it came into being in 1948 under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It was a response to the genocides of World War II and even before. The rights are universal. They're inherent to every individual. They're about allowing people to live free from torture, free from summary execution, to allow them to speak their mind, to have free expression, freedom of religion, and generally all of the rights that you would consider for uh, living a healthy, independent life. So in the aftermath of the Second World War and the horrors that attached to that grand conflict, mm -hmm. we had for the first time in human history a cross-cultural consensus that there were certain essentials that all human beings, regardless of their age, mm -hmm. regardless of their culture, regardless of their country, that each human being had certain inalienable, mm -hmm. essential rights. Correct. And these were codified. And since that day, the society really has an obligation to protect those rights. Well, yes. Uh, every government who signed on to the Universal Declaration can be held accountable. But it's not a treaty in the same way that you have right. formal uh, statutes and treaties where you can use the, the signatories and get them to have to abide by what they agreed to in the treaty. This was an aspirational statement mm -hmm. um, that allowed uh, governments to say, yes, we do believe in these kinds of things. And it started with civil and political rights, obviously, freedom of torture, freedom from summary execution, and moved into social, cultural, and economic rights. Um, it is the foundation on which a healthy society, or what we call civil societies, are based, allowing people to have freedom of choice and how they live their life without being repressed for their religion, their ethnic background, their cultural background, their sexual orientation. There are all kinds of uh, ways that governments tend to repress people be for mostly because governments want to hold power, but they also repress people based on their own cultural biases. So the Universal Declaration was the platform for that. There have been a number of treaties over the years, but it really wasn't until, honestly, until the late 70s, early 80s with the Helsinki Accords that human rights became a language that started to filter into the culture and to filter into the media. Talk about the Helsinki Accords. Well, the Helsinki Accords were a follow-up uh, from a number of treaties that were being signed at the time by uh, the U.S. government under the Ford administration signed on to them. Uh, there were provisions for economics and for trade, but one of the provisions, one of the three provisions, uh, was a, a statement on human rights. And that was in an effort to get the Soviet Union to release itself, release the people that it was repressing in all of its Soviet states, right? So it was interesting because the Soviet Union actually signed the accords, which gave leverage for the international community to say, hey, wait, you can't do this in X place or well, with Y. If you sign y. it, you have to enact them. You have you, to conduct yourself well, as if they were true. You would hope so. But, I mean, the U.S. has signed the Convention Against Torture, and that didn't hold up very long after 9-11. So part of the founding 
of Human Rights Watch is really not a matter of litigating in court as much as it is as holding people accountable and publicly accountable. Right. We don't do litigation. That would be the ACLU. We work in countries where you might not have access to courts. Right. We're trying to change policy and practice of governments and others who, um, who are in some sort of authority or power where their position can help make change. And so that, that could be the government, and very often it is. Uh, often the media is a target because if the information doesn't get out, then change can happen, right? Human rights, uh, in the movement we say human rights abuses happen in the dark. Nobody knows they're happening, nobody can change them. So we, we're pressing in a lot of different ways. Even really bad governments do not want to be put in a spotlight of saying, you are committing this kind of abuse against these people. So part of your function is to provide sunshine in those very dark places. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I'm, we do it extraordinarily well. But the movement has changed, particularly over the last 10 years. It's grown, it's become much more robust. There are a lot more uh, human rights groups. Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International are the only two international human rights groups working on a spectrum of issues. Whereas there are lots of groups that are working on LGBT issues or women's issues or children's issues or religious issues. Um, and they may be international, they might not be. So the, really you have those two groups. We work very differently than Amnesty. We work at the we spend a lot more time working at the policy level. Our targets may be two, three, four people at the United Nations or in Washington or in Paris. Um, we don't have a lot of constituents the way Amnesty does, so we don't do a letter writing campaign. We can not put a protest on the street. But what we can do is make sure that the policymakers who have the authority to make change on a certain issue hear what we have to say. Talk a little bit about how Human Rights Watch is organized, the kinds of people that you have, the kinds of functions that you execute which within the organization. Well, the kinds of people we have are extraordinary. Really, we have over 100 researchers. That's a term of art in the human rights field. These are people who know their countries or issues intimately. They have been in their countries on their issues for a very long time. Uh, they tend to be incredibly courageous. They tend to be uh, incredibly smart and well-educated. They put themselves in situations where most people would uh, likely not want to be, to gather information, to gather the evidence, to bring it out. But then that's the first part of it, that gathering. Getting the information out, getting it into the hands of the people who can make change, that's where the impact comes from. So you can have big impacts, like, um, so we were the founder of the Coalition to Ban Landmines, and we won the Nobel Peace Prize along with uh, four other groups. Uh, we were the lead on creating the International Criminal Court. We were the lead on creating um, a treaty on child soldiers that no one under the age of 18 can be put into active military service. Um, and there are a number of those um, of those landmark uh, events in the human rights movement. But then there's change in a lot of other ways. It might not be that we have to move the entire UK government to say something. It may be better that we move a company to say something or a bilateral institution to say something or to get the World Bank to look at something. So we can have, we can make change um, in ways that people might not even process as a, a human rights change. Violations of human rights are very often exercised by the powerful in order to sustain their power. And so opposition to those violations are, is often defined as a form of treason. And so the people who point out the violations are frequently themselves targeted. All the time all the time. Our partners right now in Russia are being t seriously targeted, and you can see that in the media. Um, and then there's, there's different types of targets, because women are going to be targeted differently than men, right? right? Particularly in certain regions. And children are targeted differently than 
either men or women. So you really have to t take a look at who the victim is and what the best path to impact and change can be. We did a report recently in the United States, because there are human rights abuses in the United States, um, on child tobacco workers where the growers, the tobacco growers, are using child labor. Kids as young as 13, 14 years old, picking tobacco 12 hours a day, where the absorption of the nicotine from picking tobacco is the equivalent of three packs of cigarettes a day. And they're not going to school. And they're not being given water or meals or anything Plus like that. Plus there is deniability because everything is done through subcontractors, everything is done Well, interestingly enough, we pressed not only the major tobacco companies like Philip Morris, but also tobacco, tobacco growers associations to make policy change. And that is happening right now. So as the Deputy Executive Director, you're responsible for fundraising and for uh, marketing, communications. Mm -hmm. Talk um, about how you, first of all, create the incentives, the engagement to have people contribute to programs that very often are not felt within the country of the donors. That's a good question. Um, more and more donors are becoming, at least donors to human rights issues, are uh, very sophisticated people who see human rights abuses right where they live and then are attuned to uh, what's going on globally. So they, mm -hmm. they are well read, they're well um, educated in the issues themselves. Human Rights Watch's constituency is uh, kind of shockingly small. Uh, we'll raise uh, $80 million this year, and it'll come from about 1,100 donors globally. 60% of our annual income comes from individual and foundation donors giving 100000 a year or more. And you don't accept any government no government money, no. Money. They're, all, they're all targets, right? No government money. And we do take corporate money, but I don't spend a lot of resources against um, raising corporate money. We are a human rights group that does come into conflict with some of the self-interest that corporations have. But more importantly than that, corporations give about 5% of the annual philanthropic dollar in the U.S. at least. And so, and they require a lot of time and attention. So I'd rather work with individuals or foundations who are more set up to make the contribution without anticipating any kind of return for it. And do, do these individuals, uh, corporations, the foundations, do they give for uh, particular restricted yes. causes? Yes. We so talk about how you organize that. and and describe how you don't end up painting yourself into a corner of having so many donations with so many strings attached that you can't actually operate where you need to. Well, of the $80 million, we probably have about $35 million that's restricted and designated, meaning that somebody wants to fund children's rights work in Egypt. We might already have a researcher doing that, mm -hmm. so I'll take that contribution from the donor and restrict it to that work that was already in the budget but didn't have a funder. Right. The other kind of uh, restricted money is the purely restricted where we weren't doing the work, we didn't have the money to do the work, and we can only do it with an outside, with a, an additional funder. Um, so it, it is a balancing act for sure, but we also, are, we're in a position where we're pretty clear about what we want to cover, why we want to cover it, and we're, I think, very good at making the case to individuals. People have all kinds of self-interest and self-motivation. We can have we launched recently launched a disability rights program, right. and I found a lot of people that are in, were in our network that were people whose family members uh, have disabilities of mm -hmm. one kind or another, and they really were personally connected to it. Um, sometimes the connection is people who really wanted to, when they were in high school or college, they really wanted to change the world. 
And then they grew up and they made a lot of money and had their families and made their businesses. And being a part of Human Rights Watch and contributing to Human Rights Watch is their expression of helping to have that impact, that little bit of impact that I can make a difference. And that has been really powerful. So what's interesting to me is how you connect um, certain dots. You have certain activities that you're pursuing where you are always seeking funders. You have funders whose own passion might cause you to direct a particular part of the organization to pursue that passion if it aligns to your mission. Yes. You yes. have mm. people who have a passion that might not be directed, would, would wish to be in some way useful mm -hmm. to this cause of advancing human rights, and you connect in that way. It's, it, it's very interesting to, to see sort of the systematic elements of that process. So nothing is happening sort of by coincidence or, or no. randomly. You've got no. a whole series of activities, you have messages, you have uh, causes, you have programs, and you are every, every day trying to forge those connections, identifying those people with the capacity to, to fund, and the need on the other side within Human Rights Watch uh, to, to, to utilize that, that funding uh, effectively. With a certain constituent of donor who, in addition to being people with capacity, obviously, and people who have an interest in this, well, there are also people who want to get involved. And mm -hmm. they want to have, besides giving money, they would like to be in a position where they can actually contribute to some part of the work. So we created something called the Human Rights Watch Council. Uh, today it is a series of 18 committees around the world. Uh, these committees act as quasi-boards. They don't have fiduciary responsibility, but they do have responsibility to help us raise money, obviously, help us do outreach in the community to community leaders whose opinions matter. So we might partner with McGill in Montreal to do a panel discussion on international justice. Or we might partner with the Contemporary Art Museum in Chicago to do uh, an exhibit of Darfur drawings. So we, they, they themselves make all of those decisions, who they want to partner with, how they want to do that. And then occasionally, where they have the expertise and where they have the access, they will actually participate in an advocacy initiative with us. So we did take some of our committee members from Geneva and from London to visit with the IOC, and so that they can come in as individuals who are well known uh, and who have their own power and authority to tell the IOC, we think you really need to pay attention to this. Human Rights Watch, as part of this grand conspiracy to take care of, uh, of other, peop uh, other people, is an amazing organization. What does the future hold for you? Is, is your future going to look like your past, or are there new challenges that you must meet? That's a really good question. Um, five years ago, George Soros uh, helped launch a campaign to double the size of Human Rights Watch, which we've been able to do with his gift. It was about making Human Rights Watch broader and deeper. We knew we had a good model, we knew we could make change, but there were so many things that we weren't covering. And the world was starting to change, right? You had the BRIC nations when right. before it was always the Western countries. So we were able to do that with his gift. And I think we've really made a mark with his gift. What happens in the next five years? I think for Human Rights Watch, one of the things that we're looking at very deeply is when we wrote the 2010 plan, there wasn't a Twitter. There's no such thing, right? The way we project information, Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, 
the the website is an important it's almost like an archive right the website right. is really important for people who want to go deeply into a subject but to get that information out in real time and to get people to take action on it it doesn't happen through the website anymore so how else can we project this information how can we get it into the hands of governments who might not be the classic western powers but they have a power over a specific issue in their region. And you want them to have voice on that? You want to empower them to have voice? You want to give them the information so that they can speak out? Human Rights Watch, an amazing organization. Michelle Alexander, thank, thank you. you so much thank for, you for sharing having me. your experience with us. And thank you for your insights. You're welcome.